The first issue that we wanted to discuss today um, is uh, about the link between our data-centric uh, society and our information economy uh, and what data centers do. I mean, we live in a world um, which is increasingly IT dependent, and this in turn demands that data centers provide ever greater levels of capability and capacity. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to point to a function or a feature or some aspect of, uh, of this IT-centric world which is impacting data center requirements and what it means to the people in the room who are responsible for data strategy and operations. Sean, you've been sitting here the longest. Let's go ahead and start with you, if you could please talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I think one of the major impacts to all of us in the room and where the data center is heading in modernizing will be cloud adoption. I think as we all look to move our workloads towards cloud, possibly to 100% cloud adoption, um, one day that might happen, I'm not sure when that's going to be, but right now we're in a mix of IT infrastructure that needs to live on the data center floor and a component of cloud. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing currently today is how do you put in the hybrid cloud deployment within a facility that's going to allow you to scale and be flexible for the next two, three years, which is quite frankly time we really don't understand what is going to happen. Things are changing quite rapidly. The next two to three years are going to be impactful and we need to ensure that we see that flexibility in the center. Thank you, Sean. And actually, uh, yesterday's Academic Congress talked all about, including uh, Shivajit's panel, the future facilities, and that, that's, uh, that is a concern that, that, uh, that is shared by everybody here, I think. Um, as a hint, if we could get everybody to turn their cell phone volume down to zero, that would be terrific. Um, Rami, maybe we could, uh, we could move on to you. What, did, what do you see uh, uh, sh shaping? Um, what functions or features from the IT-centric world do you see shaping uh, data center uh, requirements? Definitely. Thanks, Michael. So as, um, as an application engineer working in uh, Intel's data center management solutions group, we work with uh, all sorts of partners and customers, uh, and most, most of them have extremely new and innovative use cases and applications. Most of them create and produce and uh, depend on a lot of data. Uh, Intel, for example, has been investing a lot recently in autonomous driving, and it's expected that a fully autonomous vehicle is going to be transferring four terabytes of data per day. Uh, a lot of that is going to be, you know, transferred between vehicles, but a lot of that is going to have to go to data centers to be processed and analyzed, and you know, uh, in, in terms of deep learning, machine learning, or computer vision, image processing, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, our CEO Bob Swan just recently in a keynote mentioned that 50% of, of today's world's data has been generated in the last two years only, and only 2% of that has been analyzed. So that only 2% of that is what has been analyzed for its purpose. Good for it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's basically to sum it up, it's the extreme amount of data that we're depending depending on today in all these technological uh, advancements and use cases. And that's what's mostly driving, you know, increases in the data center capacity. Thanks very much. That's uh, a little sobering. Um, Andrew, maybe you could uh, give us uh, your perspective, which might be... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not as qualified as this gentleman. Uh, <laughs> to answer. I don't work for Intel, but certainly have been, a, you know, as a, as a CIO for a couple of decades, uh, certainly a, a buyer of these types of services. Um, I will say, you know, certainly one thing that that I see, I mean, and you saw it. Every, we didn't see the parade the other day with the uh, with the Raptors, right? Everybody saw it. Well, what what happens, right? No one could use their cell phones, and, and you get the this this is the battle between like the network people and the data center people. I know the data center people here say no, it was the network and vice versa. So I mean, that's, that's that's the way it goes. But and that's just people driven. What happens when now you get? you know, billions and billions and billions of IoT sensors and other things putting the load on. How do you predict that? And then at the application layer, um, what is the application doing that then is driving the demand? How do you even predict what what you need? So that's that's it. And so, sorry, that's not an answer. Certainly a question from my perspective. I'm not sure anyone has the answer to it. 
but I did see some really amazing posters out there which I have no idea what they are. Um, so I'm sure that there are some people figuring some of these things out. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Francois? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm the guy from France. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been a long journey. It was really good weather yesterday, so I, I vowed for uh, you know the, uh, the, the good weather picture. Um, just, uh, I think, uh, not, not everybody knows OVH. Happy to go to the detail on the breakout, uh, but basically, um, we run a different way of doing data centers, and that's why my title is industrial and not uh, infrastructure. I'd be normally in, a, in another firm like infrastructure officer and not OVH industrial officer, because the way we're looking at cloud adoption, the way we're looking at um, uh, how to uh, deal with that explosion of data we've just discussed, is to have uh, yeah standardized more uh, uh, like a supply chain type approach for all our needs more than a typical you know project approach. So we'll delve into that and with Mary in the working group we've, we've worked a lot on that. And I, I think this is really what you'll see in in, uh, in the future how to deal with it is go for more like an elastic consumption and have a, a very industrial way of looking at uh, the, uh, the demand. Yeah, and in our prep call, you talked about the change in the consumption pattern, right? Yeah, actually, I think, you know, now it's like a, you, um, we see a lot of people, they want to consume uh, IT as a service, clearly, that we're referring to what you just said, and they don't really care about the hardware, you know. There's still a lot of people, they're very interested in what is a beast, what is the actual machine, etc. but more and more people will just be, I want X amount of compute, X amount of storage right now. And just for a few hours, or like for uh, a few months, and we see a lot of people moving to that very quickly, uh, actually even quicker than I anticipated. And in front of that, in terms of provider, uh, you need to adapt to to be able to handle this. Thank you, um, Gada. Can you um, point to a function or feature uh, that is impacting data center requirements, and and talk a little bit about what it means to the folks in the room? Okay. So first, I want to say I'm one of the people trying to find a solution for those questions. <laughs> so find me. <laughs> and yeah, if you have a question regarding the poster, find me. I'm directed to the, to the students who uh, also the poster. Um, so yes, I I see like it's um, all of the things that they've mentioned. They've mentioned machine learning. As Dr. Gotham said yesterday, you cannot be in a conference in 2019 and not take that word. Uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, Sorani has said, four terabytes of communication between vehicles, but you can also think about infotainment. So nowadays, you have DVDs, passengers in the back seat watching it. In a couple of years, they are going to be streaming Netflix to those seats, and maybe two Netflix, different Netflix movies to every seat. Right? So uh, I did some research with vehicle network networks, a big part of it is infotainment. So the new, all of these new things are going to bring new applications that we don't even think about right now. Uh, of course, IT is another big thing. Uh, some of the things that going on in research now is trying to think of, OK, all of these uh, sensors are going to be smart. And for example, Alexa or Google Home, you need a connection to the internet. You need to send it back to a data center to do the crunching of the data. Can we do the crunching on the data on the device itself so that we decrease the amount um, data crunching that needed by data center. And again, introduction of uh, 5G and the delay that we're going to need, as Shubhajit said yesterday, and then into the microseconds, right? Tens of microseconds delay that we're going to be needing in the future. So I think it's a combination of all of those that are going to be affecting how the data centers uh, move in the future. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, <laughs> Stefan, can you uh, can you please uh, give us your perspective on this issue? Absolutely, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm not going to repeat what we've heard over and over again, but I think we're starting to understand that the name of the game is data. And what I'd also suggest to you is you're seeing here that multiple industries are all moving the same direction towards that data, so you're going to have some, some exponential growth that's going on. Uh, RBC is no different from that. There's a few things that are being that are big concerns for RBC. Obviously, cloud adoption. It is a quick uh, are a quicker and more agile solution than enterprise-owned bricks and mortar for growth, and the growth is obviously, again, like I said, data. Now, the other compounding problem that we're seeing here is that we're a traditional bank. We have traditional methods of banking, but if we want to move to the digital experience, we know that that's the future of banking if we want to survive. It's not so much the bricks and mortar. Uh, 
compounding that, we also understand that data has its own value. Google has made a whole company out of that, and RBC and any other bank for that matter has a keen awareness of what's going on from a financial perspective of all its clients, and that can be translated into analytics. So where did that bring us? Well, it, it brings me to a lot of different challenges within my, uh, my portfolio around the globe, and that's the growth for data storage. First and foremost, like everybody else, there's good ITIL processes that we want to follow, so on back up to all the, uh, all the usual uh, rigor that we put behind managing data in Compute. But we're also regulated by a lot of compliance, so we're a little nervous about disrupting or corrupting data. So we start having multiple instances of data links in order to, to keep the, the, the original data intact and, and uh, unaffected. Well, that just compounds our problem for storage needs and so on and so forth. So. For us, the data is the name of the game. Uh, incredible growth, spurts of growth. How do we manage that within physical infrastructure? And I think that's part of the answer. Thank you very much. Peter, the last word to you. What, what do you, I mean, you have deeper experience here than anybody does. What do you see changing the demands on data centers? Yeah, I'm, I'm the guy from California, with, uh, from LA, actually. So whether it's just like here, <laughs> almost. Um, so yeah. Uh, as, uh, as you said, yeah, I've been around for a long time, and um, this is probably the most exciting time in the, in the data center business I've ever seen this industry uh, being so dynamic, moving so fast, and growing so, so dramatically. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm not going to repeat what uh, everybody said here, much better than I, could, than I could do, but if you look at the major trends that are shaping this industry today, obviously, the cloud is the most the most obvious trend, but uh, but then you look at the growth of uh, um, 5G that will lead to the um, IoT explosion, and uh, that will lead to the, the uh, growth of the edge data center, which is the next next frontier in this in, in our business. Um, software defined everything. Uh, a fascinating thing. Uh, we, we had software defined compute uh, network and. Uh, and storage for a while, uh, software-defined power is the next big thing to crown the most fascinating new development in this industry. Um, uh, the, this business has been, has been uh, trying to accomplish something like this for uh, a very long time. It's the first time we do indeed uh, see uh, the emergence of uh, software-defined power. And um, finally, um, the continuous growth of uh, AI and um, analytics that uh, are also uh, changing the face of the industry. So among uh, examples, I asked for example of a function, um, I would call uh, the open source infrastructure um, uh, one of the most, uh, the most uh, interesting developments. Uh, um, OCP, and I'm sure you're familiar with OCP, and primarily uh, and also Open19, uh, developed by uh, LinkedIn, uh, uh, are also changing this industry both at the hyperscale level but also also have an impact on uh, on the edge data center and uh, um, it's it's primarily driven now this is this is a maturing industry and like any maturing uh, business it's it's becoming commoditized uh, uh, whether we like it or not um, this is this is the general trend and uh, although reliability continues to be one of the most important priorities of this industry. Uh, now we're looking at the cost, total cost of ownership and energy and energy efficiency and uh, obviously security, scalability, uh, uh, flexibility as uh, uh, major priorities uh, and OCP uh, and Open19 respond to that. Uh, it's all about uh, um, standardization, it's all about uh, reducing cost, improving energy efficiency, uh, and reducing the cost of, uh, of uh, hardware. Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's exactly what we were hoping for from this first question, is to sort of set out the fence posts that, uh, oh, don't, don't let it go too far there, Peter. Uh, <laughs> was to set out the fence posts that would define the topics that we would need to address and consider as, as factors in the data center industry today. So we've got cloud and hybrid, autonomous vehicles, IoT, massive data, the network and data centers to deal with that data, more data, and its uh, rising value and, and its lakes. Um, analytics, AI, 5G, edge, uh, and software defined. I would say that if you look at the agenda, which Mary presented, and which you can find in a little bit more detail in the uh, 
show guide and source guide that hopefully everybody here has, um, you'll see that those are, in fact, the, uh, the themes that, that we've uh, chosen to uh, dig into today. And, and, you know, while they are discrete topics, they also blend together into a, a collective requirement for, uh, for data center support. I'd like to kind of move on to be a, to kind of drill down a level here and, and ask what technologies or, or strategies or other forces, operational practices, do you think are most important to bringing data center capabilities into sync with these multiple sources of increased demand? And you can choose to speak to it either in the, uh, a one to two year period or a three to five year period, or both if you choose. Peter, maybe you could, uh, maybe you could kick us off with, uh, with this one. And, I mean, what, what technologies or practices do you think will be most important to addressing the challenges you just spelled out? Um, it, it's a long list. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to start probably with uh, um, server disaggregation and uh, uh, the, uh, the rack disaggregation, uh, all driven by the by Silicon Tonics and uh, the gentleman from Intel here probably uh, can speak more intelligently about these subjects than I could do. Uh, I find it uh, fascinating the fact that, uh, uh, as you very well know, we're approaching the the, uh, the limit of uh, Moore's law, um, the increasing this, the, the the frequency, the clock speed, um, you know, the inductance of the copper on the motherboard is becoming uh, yeah, significant. So, uh, moving to uh, for ties to, uh, to the fiber will uh, um, address this issue. Uh, uh, we, can, we can move uh, 100 gigabytes uh, uh, through, through fiber. So that will enable uh, to disaggregate, to move, uh, to move uh, uh, the, uh, the processing for uh, storage in the rack and you know that's happening now but uh, uh, a few years from now uh, we're going to see the, the true disaggregation of the of the, the server itself with uh, processing memory uh io is going to be uh segregated in uh, dedicated trays so if you need to uh i don't know um replace the atom uh, processor you don't have to replace the whole the, the whole uh, servers uh, other examples uh, that uh, uh, things that are uh, changing this industry. Uh, uh, Hyperconvergence uh, is, uh, is a big trend and uh, uh, will simplify architecture or reduce cost. Um, uh, data center management as a service, uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating topics uh, will, will also have a great impact on the way we, uh, we manage uh, and operate data centers in the future. And uh, also uh, the concept of distributed res uh, resiliency, uh, it's not necessarily a, a new product or a function, but uh, it's a new, um, uh, new way to, to look at the, uh, the behavior and the performance of, uh, of a data center. Uh, historically, uh, as I said, reliability was the, the key factors now with, uh, with cloud, with mirroring operations, with uh, uh, availability zones, all these things are uh, changing. The, the data center itself, it's not a binary thing, it's not on or off anymore. Uh, we, we have uh, the ability to uh, to operate in, in a reduced stage, uh, and uh, it's more about, uh, not only about uh, failure, but also uh, ability to recover and time to recover. So, um, in spite of all this, uh, you look at uh, some major events that uh, um, have a, had an impact on our lives in the uh, last 12 months. We saw big, uh, uh, big hyperscale uh, uh, cloud players and banks <coughs> and big telecommunication uh, you know, companies that uh, had data center failures. And in spite of their their uh, 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 software-driven uh, uh, reliability. Uh, uh, Safe, safe transfer from one facility to, to another. Uh, uh, it didn't quite work, and uh, you know a lot of people uh, um, losing uh, inability to use Instagram for five minutes was a major, major uh, 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 traumatic event. Uh, 
Uh, so it, yeah, it's a brave new world. There are a lot of things uh, uh, new happening here, and uh, um, it's uh, it's just a matter of time until uh, until all these things are sorted out, and uh, we're going to have the next generation data centers. Thank you very much, um, Stefan. When you look out at the next one to two years, and the next three to five years, what do all these new demands mean to your uh, your strategic planning for uh, for data center infrastructure? It is it is quite a challenge. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is quite a challenge for many reasons. First and foremost, uh, just to give you some context from an RBC perspective, we're obviously a long-term legacy company with a lot of legacy IT. So that's one of the first challenges that are really uh, compounding our problems. Because as, as Peter mentioned, hyperconvergence is key and homogenous technology is really key. And the things that we're looking at is, from an IT perspective, from a programming perspective, is to use containerized solutions, not unlike what we do here in the industry from a data center perspective basically taking your security container and your network container and so on so that you can just slap them in. Now, in order to do that, you have to have uh, homogenous type platforms. We, we've got Unix, we've got mainframe, we've got Windows, and we have them all. So that's a bit of a challenge that we have. Plus, uh, we've heard already previously that there's that demand as a service, and they want that demand now. We, we as a, uh, a old legacy environment, our bricks and mortars are challenged now on how we're going to actually move forward and, and provide said services immediately. So as, as we're doing that, we're, we're having great discussion. Obviously, cloud is part of the solution, but uh, not all applications are suited for cloud. They have to be reprogrammed. They need to be reprogrammed. becomes our next problem, which is we don't decommission anything, obviously, until we build something, commission it, and so on and so forth, and make sure that it's good so that we can transition over. Um, that takes its own inherent time. So it doesn't seem like it's moving fast. That's safe and soundness. It doesn't always seem to be the case. However, what we are doing, because we are a, a, a company of scale, we have on-prem cloud. We, of course, use public cloud, and to some extent, we'll use some hybrid cloud as well when we want on-prem cloud. The philosophy is the cloud, the cloud philosophy where we get to that homogenous technology, that we use containers, and that we can be able to ramp up brand, ramp up as well. And we're getting there, but it's going to be a heavy lift. And I think we're going to have another opportunity later to discuss why it's such a heavy lift for us, and I'll explain to you one thing that's been a great challenge for me later. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta you come at this from a research point of view. What do you see being most important to shaping the requirements that everybody in the room is dealing with over the next year or two and then over the longer term? So as a researcher, I think my vision might be a little bit more futuristic. Uh, for me, the data center in the future is an edge data center. So the way I see it is that you're going to have a small couple of racks every a uh, couple, like 100 meters down the road to be able to, as I said, stream Netflix to multiple seats in your car, right? You're not gonna be able to do that with a um, current architecture. So the challenge that is going to be there, I see, is managing all those data centers. So now, instead of having a big enterprise manage tens of data centers, now this enterprise has to manage hundreds and thousands of data centers. I think one from uh, Uptime Institute yesterday was saying that 50% of downtown, uh, downtime in data centers is because of human errors. So the more humans you have managing those data centers, the more opportunity you have for them to generate errors. So for me, I don't see the future without uh, autonomous monitoring, without fault prediction and detection of anomalies and sending alerts and alarms before anything that happens. You're not going to be able to have the workforce to be able to do regular maintenance on all of these data centers. So your equipment has to be smart enough to say, hey, something is going on with me. Send somebody. I need to be checked, <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is, this is where I see the future is coming. Also control. We cannot leave control to be, for him, to, to be managed by humans. The, the, the data center has to be able to control itself. Cooling has to be able to control itself. Um, one other thing is you have multiple data centers down the road and you're streaming Netflix, that movie has to follow you down the road, right? So you have to be able to move the workload, not just from one uh, virtual, one machine, physical machine to another, you need to move it across data centers, right? So these are all of the challenges that we're looking into for a future data center. Thank you. Um, Francois, you're part of the solution here as a, as a hyperscaler yourself. Um, what do you see becoming important to your internal operations and, and in your ability to support clients over the next year and then over the next three to five? Yeah, uh, 
First, I mean, I hear a lot of things that are really critical to, to the industry at the moment, like how to deal with legacy versus cloud adoption or other things, and that definitely uh, that will be a big uh, focus in the one, next one to two years. Whether we need a lot of edge or whether we'll work with more centralized remains to be seen. You know, we could discuss probably hours on this because there's different use cases. We're pretty sure that the centralization of data center will be like a few big hyperscalers, but then probably on the edge you'll have multiple type of uh, players, multiple type of application. But another thing that I'd like to actually focus on um, and it's a great panel to have so many different point of views. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I agree with everything that has been said. Um, is power density in the in the data centers? Um, I think I mean, uh, if you go back back in 2000, you know, if you had a, you know uh, 100 watt per square feet, that was pretty much a, a high power density data center. I'm not talking about the supercomputer, right? But more mm -hmm. like the high performance, uh, but like in commoditized data centers. Uh, so how to reach like 20, 30, 40 kilowatt per rack, which is already kind of a, mm -hmm. the case, but even go higher. Um, I, you know, I, you know, we work a lot with all the processor manufacturers, like Intel, obviously, uh, big partners, uh, but Nvidia, AMD, and when you see the curve of their, like, what of the CPU, of CPU or GPU, it's uh, it's going up, right? Uh, and then on uh, the data center operator, you like. Yeah, it's great. Uh, good performance on the small thing, but I need to manage that heat, right? <laughs> so I like it, but you know I want to be able to manage this. So our solution has always been liquid cooling. Um, I was discussing with Sir David yesterday, and it was like, this is the future. Now, for us, it's been the past for 15 years. We've been actually deploying water cooling on, on the processor for the last 15 years. We actually run. 300,000 server, commoditized server on liquid cooling at the moment, uh, including 70,000 in, in, in Bois Noir near uh, Montreal, actually. Uh, and this is the way we, 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 we look at this. And we can continue to, um, to, to believe in that technology for us. But basically, it brings water in the IT room. So this is a big ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, like when you say that, like, 90% of the people don't talk to me after that because I'm crazy, right? So, no, actually, we've developed an operational kind of knowledge on how to deal with that, and, and there is actually a lot, we're talking about Open Compute and Open 19, this is exactly what they're doing as well, and it's, it's also make sure your hardware is plug and play and standardized so you could actually go up in, in power density. Um, and definitely, this is uh, something we, uh, we build it strongly in and will be prevalent in the future, in my opinion. But again, to Stefan's point, it will be a mix of legacy system with new system. And how to deal with this hybrid solutions will be a mix of hardware and software as well. We see a lot of company kind of emerging in the landscape to, our, to, to manage, like orchestrator. They can do VMware, they can do Kubernetes, they can do everything, and they will manage that for, for you. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned that the themes that are being spoken about here will be echoed in some of the sessions that uh, follow. We do have a, a session later today on uh, establishing and managing high density environments. It includes people running data centers at 20, 30, and 50 kilowatts uh, a rack, plus a supplier of liquid cooling. So uh, if, if this is something of interest to you, please go to that. Sean, I think I'm going to skip right over to you at the far end of the table because you too, uh, he only gets one microphone. Uh, <laughs> because um, you, I mean, you too uh, uh, are a hyperscale provider and, and wrestle with these issues kind of at a different level than most of the room does, but, but on behalf of quite a lot of the organizations in the room. What do you see changing within your environment or driving your strategic plan over the next year or two and then over the longer term? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I think it's a it's a great question. You know, what's changing? Probably everything um, is the easy answer. Um, how do we break that down, and how do we plan over the next one to two years? Probably that's something we can build some scalable and flexible solutions into to be able to manage quick, upgradable power um, cooling solutions. Being able to um, add high density racks in areas that weren't typically for that. You know, we used to see on average a 4 kW rack. Mm -hmm. We're now seeing on average probably 8 to 12 across the data center with some that are greater than 20. 
So the how to come up with these solutions and how do we build our facilities not for day one deployments anymore, which is the traditional way we used to build. We'd lay out the paperwork, we'd grab an engineer, we'd make a design, we'd say we're going to average you know, 4 kW across the floor, so much power, so much cooling, and, and we just, that's the way the facility lived. We were successful at bringing people in. In our product in particular, being a multi-tenant data center, we're not sure what the next customer is going to bring us. So we have to be very thoughtful on how we build our facilities. Do we have enough power on day one that's at the facility that we can scale for the customer? Do we have enough cooling capacity that's going to be able to allow our business to grow? Because let's face it, when you put your deployment within a data center, it's not just for one or two years, it's for the long term. Um, and I typically ask people the question, how long do you want this to function well for? Well, so you just look at me like, I don't know, like five years, eight years? Okay, well, let's start thinking that way. Let's start thinking out that far. And when you ask people what their deployment's going to look like in year five, most of them really don't have a good idea, right? Equipment's going to refresh, technologies are refreshing. The consumption of data um, is just, you know, overwhelming to see how much data is being used up. So will it have enough capacity? How do we get the fiber into the ground? How do we get those access routes in and out? So. Michael, I don't know if I have a great uh, answer to your question. There's a ton of challenges, but look, we have to look at scalable and flexible solutions first and foremost. We're looking at software to find, you know, as Peter said, everything. So we're now moving towards software to find networking capabilities where, you know, through a connect type product, we're going to allow a customer to come in, stand up to, you know, one gig, 10 gig, 100 gig connections into our fabric and then allow them to turn up connections quickly to, you know, if that's any of the cloud providers, AWS, IBM, Google, and I see that moving as well towards carriers jumping on that fabric where Bell's now going to deliver into that fabric, Telus will deliver into that fabric, and you'll be able just to turn up your connections, turn them down, move work workload where you want them to be. I think the days in the data center of actually grabbing a fiber pair, running it to the cabinet or to the switch, running it over to a panel like goes to a meet your room, I think, you know, those days are slowly dying. It's about having everyone connected on the back end of that fabric so that a customer can come in, quickly light up their two connections and start moving. I think software defined power is another one, something that we've been using not through a software defined system, but allowing our customers to install, let's say 11 or 22 kW on day one, installing the PDU on day one, and doing a software adjusted threshold that will send us alarms. So if the customer buys 6 kW, software tells us they're at 6 kW, when they get to 80% of their 6KW and send us an alarm, we send a note to the customer saying, would you like to purchase more? They're like, yeah, and we seamlessly just turn that, we just turn that alarm up. So again, why is that good? Quick turnaround, no electrician to the site to do that after day one, and allows the customer to make those quick changes. And even if there was an issue where the customer were to spike over what they purchased, they're already sitting with 11 or 22. So don't have to worry about a trip breaker. It's just really a software to find an alarm that's going to go out and start flashing saying that you've gone over that. So, I mean, lots to think about, containerized solutions, software-defined networking capabilities, flexible architecture, um, mean time to repair, how do we quickly recognize there's a problem and what's the turnaround to get that repaired? I think, you know, most people in the data center now have realized it's, you know, the days of 2004 when you moved in the data center and thought nothing was ever going to happen or gone. I think most people recognize that things are going to break within those facilities. How quickly can we recognize that? How quickly can we turn it around and get that facility back up and running? So, lots of good questions. Probably not a lot of answers for me, but something we're thinking about. Well, it must have been a pretty good answer. I saw heads nodding all the way down the table there. And Which I did, is with all the challenges. I think they agree. I did tell people that if they looked at me, I'd steer the conversation towards them. And Andrew's been, like, looking over at me. So, Andrew, you want to grab the microphone and go ahead and expand on that? Sure. Again, I'm not qualified to talk about what you should do in, in the data center. Um, but from a customer perspective, which I've been for, uh, for quite a while, and we are talking about syncing things up, I think it's really important to understand what's going on within the customer. Um, the end user. I mean, everybody's creating applications on mass these days, and less and less and less know anything about a data center. Um, so I think what's key is that you know those in the data center business learn to translate, learn to become experts, and actually come up to actually help customers uh, to be effective in what they're doing. I mean, I moved from being CIO of a big 
uh, global organization and understanding data centers. I've been in the data center probably six or seven years, and now with the startup, you know, I can just log in online and buy servers and buy computing power, and I mean, it's it's so easy, it's crazy. We're probably still using a lot of your services, but not not directly. So I just say it's important to kind of verticalize and figure that out because the customer increasingly uh, does not have that expertise to figure it out. Um, and then the other thing is just making it easy, and I've heard that a few times relative to you know just being able to log in to do things, to add flexibility, to add more var variability, more power, and so forth. So making it easy, uh, helping your customer figure things out, I think is, is key. Thanks, um, Peter and, and Stefan. I noticed you guys kind of comparing notes there for a little bit. Um, do you want to do you want to elaborate on what Sean said? I'll be happy to. Uh, maybe you'll be more happy than I am. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you know, it's fascinating to me that, uh, uh, to hear about uh, uh, the fact that you're, you're considering uh, uh, software-defined power. Um, because if you, if you look at uh, the major problems faced by, uh, by, by a collocation player, or it could be, it could be an enterprise, could be, a, uh, could be very well an uh, enterprise uh, uh, data center. So the, the, the biggest issues that I've seen uh, on my career are over provisioning. Uh, people build a lot more than they need because they not, never uh, know how much they need and there is a big difference between peak and uh, and uh, uh, average average uh, run. Um, they, um, <coughs> they have a lot of stranded capacity uh, both in terms of uh, cooling and power, a lot of stranded uh, capacity and used capacity but because uh, um, we are so accustomed to go to high uh, redundancy level with uh, building infrastructure that uh, uh, provide the uh, equivalent to a 2N or 2N plus 1. Uh, um, most of these facilities uh, uh, run at 34% uh, at the most. And uh, finally, the cost. Um, and uh, in addition, cost is, is obviously the most important thing. Along. Uh, and uh, and uh, finally, the, the fact that, and this, this is the biggest problem for collocation, just like you mentioned, um, inability to dynamically uh, modulate the, the level of reliability is very difficult. Uh, uh, you build the data centers that uh, is either 2N or N or, uh, or uh, some other intermediate level, and you never know what, uh, what the next customer or the next application or the next uh, the, the next uh, workload you're going to have, and uh, um, it changes, and in the build dynamically change that yeah, it's, a, it's a major, it's a major problem. So the answer to that is software defined power, and one of the things that I believe, um, and this is a lot of people disagree with me. I think that um, when it comes to facilities, to data centers, uh, the the emphasis is going to move from a centralized cooling, centralized power, centralized distribution to a more granular control at the rec level. Uh, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna be able to control the level of reliability, the density and uh, power consumption, uh, the eliminate over provisioning by, by, uh, by controlling the behavior of the, the rack itself as opposed to having uh, massive centralized cooling systems and uh, power systems and so on. Um, so what is, what is software defined power? <coughs> Essentially is, is a platform that aggregates, pulled and manages all the, the power resources in such a way that it dynamically has the ability to match supply and demand. Um, you know, uh, how do you do that physically? Uh, it sounds uh, probably too good to be true. Well, the, the way you do that is to have uh, uh, components at the rack level that will provide that, that um, um, through, through a device with, a, with using uh, lithium-ion batteries, looking some converters, uh, to supplement, uh, to supplement the, the power delivered uh, to, um, to uh, uh, be able to uh, um, address the, the the peaks the peaks of, uh, of power by doing that now all of a sudden instead of running at uh, 60 or 70 percent most companies have and it's at eight percent 
Uh, now you can go to safely to 100%. You can, um, using special switches, you have the ability to provide a various level of redundancy through, uh, uh, through, the, through the data centers and modify it dynamically. All these things uh, uh, are, are leading to the next step in the software-defined power where, we, where you dynamically can move workloads uh, to other parts of the data center, depending on what, uh, what the power is more uh, abundant, or move uh, workloads uh, throughout the world, uh, depending on uh, the reliability, depending on the cost of energy, depending on the utilization, and so on. So I think that uh, um, um, this is this is one thing that will dramatically alter the, the way we uh, we design and operate data centers in the future. Thank you. Is there still a bit of time left? A little bit. Okay, I'll try to make this as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. as, as long as I can. Okay. Well, what many of you may not know, may not be aware of that, Peter Gross was actually. Uh, the head of the company, the engineering firm that helped us design our enterprise data centers, at least our main one and part of our secondary one. Um, so it's nice to hear some of this stuff about software defined power. I'm really curious about the economics of that and making sure that there's sufficient uh, distribution system for that, those uh, spikes and then, of course, the man peaks. Um, I wonder what that all looks like. Which brings me <laughs> to one of the issues that I have as well, um, and we've got Ian Colson in the room who works on my team and he's more than well aware, and we talk about networks. I mean, the software-defined networks. It's a fantastic idea, I'd love to have it. <laughs> as soon as I get in the build to, to actually upgrade our network distribution across the entire globe, that's a substantial number. So you could build the greatest data centers, you could have software-defined everything, but if you can't connect to it, you can't afford to connect to it, we're having, uh, you know, those are one of the issues. And I mentioned I talked a little later, I don't know if it'll come up, but I'll give you a, a bit of a preview, is when you talk to the board of directors, when you talk to your, your C-suite executives, you tell them, wow, the brilliance of going to this uh, containerized solutions, the cloud environments, the economics, they're all sound and so on and so forth. Great, so you're gonna have savings, fantastic. Use those savings in order to enable it. It was what comes first, the chicken and the egg. I gotta first build it, which by the way is an investment, that's an uptick, they don't wanna see an uptick before the savings can be realized. So now what we're doing is we're actually having to take risks in the areas that we think we're, we're comfortable in risks in order to reclaim some of that funding and build a bit of it. And then as those savings come in, we take other risks, we build a bit more. And so what's happening now is, it seems like it's taking longer, it's just a complex methodology in order to, to invest in this type of technology. But I can tell you right now, we are, you know, I'm really interested in uh, software-defined power because that's gonna be, I think, a key, a key way of going forward in the infrastructure component. But I, I'd really like to understand how we can get that network component, which I think is gonna be a high priority. Thanks, um, no, I, I need to swing this down. Um, can everybody please make a note of today's date, June 20th? That's the day you heard a senior executive in IT with a financial institution say, we now have to take risks. Um, <laughs> that might be the last time ever, too. Um, Rami, you're, you're uh, I mean, uh, Stefan's looking for ways to enable change, and we're looking for software controls, and you're with the leading chip supplier in the world and, and working on software controls. Can you give us an engineering perspective yeah, on how all this works? Yeah, so this is a fascinating discussion. So uh, on the short term, we're investing a lot into data center management, and uh, that's one of the solutions that uh, we're showcasing at, at this event and at the breakout session, which is a new conveniently called data center manager, which is basically a solution that uh, exposes uh, the telemetries that are in all those servers uh, that, uh, that help you with intern, you know, do analytics on those servers in terms of uh, utilization, health, power consumption, uh, all that kind of stuff, uh, to give you better insights into how those data, those servers are being utilized and managed, and do things like EPV alerts, real-time real alerts, and those are all embedded into the servers that that, that you have today. So the solution uses the out-of-band management interface to connect to them, so there's no overhead on the servers to be able to, uh, you know. <coughs> take advantage of them. Uh, so we're investing a lot in that, and that uh, you know solution, um, you know, is cross-platform, cross-vendor. Uh, we work with a lot of OEMs that integrate our core technologies into their solutions, as well as partners of like uh, building man infrastructure management solutions, like for example, Schneider Electric is one, one of our biggest uh, uh, partners in that space. So uh, we're investing heavily into this, and um, on the longer term. We are investing in 
speaking of software-defined things, we're doing <laughs> software-defined silicon, where you're supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, selling CPUs at a specific configuration that have dormant capabilities that you can actually wake up later on as you figure out that you actually need it. So we're trying to, of course, you know, the more servers out there that benefits Intel, but we're actually trying to be part of the solution and manage this, you know, exponential growth. It's not sustainable in the long term. So we're investing quite a bit into that. Um, yeah, I think that was. That's incredible. I mean, I, we keep moving further down the path of things that I consider to be very physical and making them software defined. I thought power was the end, but silicon is even more. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. If we could, um, Eugene, maybe we can, uh, actually we can formally welcome Eugene Roman, our eighth panelist, so now we no longer have seven and a half. Um, Eugene, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go ahead and see if we can get you caught up, uh, quickly anyway. Um, what issues do you think are, are, you know, requirements, issues, workloads, do you see shaping or reshaping data center capacity uh, and capability demand? Well, without turning this into uh, a speech, you'll hear me at the end of the day. Uh, the, the term data center is wrong. It's your engine room. It's, it's what you run your company with. This is why my friend over here has problems with the board. I have the same problem. Every company I work with, I'm, I'm old, I just retired. Same problem. You go to the board and they go, yeah, okay. What's that going to cost? Can you mine over the state? That's 38 years of that nonsense. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know, I, I said to my team one day, we're going to turn it off one day. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> we actually did. We actually did. And when I was at Bell, we had a we had a power failure, and the systems, watch out for the software world here, self-corrected and shut down all the mainframes for Bell for. A, 12 hour period. It's never been seen anywhere in the world. Truck stop rolling, call centers, this happened. And it was in February, so exactly, but I like to forget that day. And every mainframe we had went silent. The guy pulled me up and said, uh, We got wrong here. Okay. How did he fool you? What do you got? <laughs> Nothing. They all shut down. And it was, a, it was a design defect in an IBM core that was there for five years. Every mainframe in the world that IBM sold after that had to have the bell patch put in. Because what would happen is, on manufacturing, it's getting complicated here, if one of the backup systems was, was not manufactured properly, it would signal, I'm off the air, and it would start to cascade and shut it down. The company stopped. IBM president from the US, not the company president, apologized, but so what? The cost to us was, was gigantic. So it's not a data center. It's your your it's your it's your vital engine room. And you know, you know, we call it back office. That's wrong too. Uh, and also the big discussion about is the software I like the way you said it, but to have that please. At the end of the day, we're, we're splitting hairs, we're counting pennies on things that run our company. If you're in a trucking business, right, and your trucks fall apart in a road you can get yourself in an awful lot of trouble pretty quickly, correct? Now, where would Amazon be if they didn't have good logistics? Where would Amazon be if they didn't have good distribution centers? So I look at it differently. I mean, I just retired from Canadian Tire. I got there in 2012, and I walked up to the data center, and they said, who are you? Well, I'm the CTO, because I wouldn't take the CIO title, because that's also a misnomer. We were technologists, not information officers. And you know why I, I, I took that title that way? Because I got tired of being, getting calls from reception at Bell. <coughs> you have information. Somebody's calling for information. Like, Stop. <laughs> you know, techno we're technology first. <laughs> Nobody had been in that center for 25 years. It was 25 years old. No, no senior leader. I was a senior leader. And the guys were nervous. I started to repeat itself in, in open text, Waterloo. You know, I had to shut it down. There was safety problems. Like, the place wasn't grounded properly. I'm a farm boy. If you don't ground something, you're going to die. You had to order people over there. That's a true story. Got to Germany, same thing. It repeats itself. And, you know, Bell, Bell actually, when I started there a long time ago, had a reasonable, reasonable setup. Until the outsourced, and the outsourcer got it. 
One of them had fans. You know, often paint fire men. I mean, what is this? Meeting us away. Screw off. <laughs> so, so, you know, we've got this thing wrong. We've had it wrong for a long time. They, they're going to hear about a concept called the Ice Age. Uh, we've got to change this. And by the way, all the talk about all of the different features and functions and, per and performance and all the AI, I just teaching on that, is meaningless unless you can actually do the computing and you have the network to support. And, you know, Canada is blowing this totally. Like, we're totally blowing it. We're a cold country. Computers need to be kept cold, right? Where is the main data center for Canadian Tire? Anybody know? Winter Peg. Hi. Yeah. They don't play basketball there, but it's awfully cold there. <laughs> That's 15 Celsius, right? And below, zero cost to cool. Now, there was a problem at minus 53 one day. <laughs> I phone. Did you put heaters in those, in those sail line lines up on the roof there? I think we did. <laughs> what happens at 53 Celsius to saline? It turns to, to slush, right? And I, I had this shocking moment. It was actually minus 45 at at, or at, at uh, Portage and Maine. Our, our center is very across from the from the uh, from the hockey rink. Minus 45, but on the roof it was minus 53. We were designed to go to minus 110. All right. Now, theoretically, not possible. Now that center use very low cost power. Why? Because you have to have low cost power. Canada has low cost power. Every low cost power point should have massive computing and data hubs. We don't have that. You know, I got a call from the Ontario government. Anybody here from the Ontario government? I'm going to apologize in advance. <coughs> well, why did you do it in Ontario? Well, now they're not going to raise their hands. Have you seen, have you seen, I said, have you seen the cost of hydro? Oh my God. Blow your brains up. So there are parts of Canada that are that are naturally advantaged. We need to take advantage of that and attract. By the, you know, we, we, we wrote our own story in, in Winnipeg. You know, the, the province was really helpful. The city was was more than helpful. The local companies were more than helpful. Be helpful. But here here's what the problem was. We got the price of our success was a small city called Winnipeg. We had trouble getting talent after eight other companies followed us. And you know, pro broken promises from universities don't go along with me. I'm where on campus here, of sorts. They promised new grads who would be trained in these specialties, and we didn't get them. And I and I and they went back and said, well, you know, you promised us 100 jobs, we guaranteed 50, we make up for 50. I said, you show me students, I'll I'll, I'll fill those seats. So you see the problem. So we we need to be more rational about these things. This is, the, this is the thing, and you know, as a retired person, because I have no handcuff, no corporate uh, officer controls anymore, I'm a pigeon, so I'm here saying, look, time for rationality. I'm not talking to boards, I'm talking to, to senior executives. It's wake up time. Because we talk about all these things that technology is doing today and will do even more so going forward. Forget us, the millennials live on this, right? You know, I was out yesterday on a farm down in Niagara with my son. Uh, we were moving bees, we're beekeepers, you know, stinging insects, but not always. And, and he's Instagramming the bees that we were moving real time, you know, up to the cloud on Instagram. Okay? Within three hours, our sales went up. That's the world we're in. Like, what are you doing? He's got a bee here on, takes off his gloves, you know, he's got a sticky hand. He's Instagramming from a truck in the field, right? An event that just happened, and he's got, you know, 19,000 followers. So that world needs needs computational power like we can't imagine. Forget peak and all of this and, and you know what's your what's your this and what's your that. That's important. That's where you guys lose your hair. <laughs> you it, you it, okay? And you get old. I'm old now. And I'll tell you, I step back, I've been almost six months retired, step back and say, what's what's good about this this world and what's bad? The bad news is we call it a data center. Okay? Your advanced computing center that runs your computing, that runs your company. You know, we talk about a, a computing center, it's a net computing center. I made up that word 20 years ago. Still not referenceable on Google or darn thing. Anyway, if you want me to stop now, so on. <laughs> I want you to save a little a bit for this afternoon. I do have to apologize. I, I spent almost an hour and a half getting here on a drive that, that uh, series said to take 30 minutes. 
Uh, I saw every street in, in this city that I didn't ever, I never ever want to visit again, and I survived because in, in, in uh, Detroit I probably would have been dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That's a, a wonderful preview of um, this afternoon's uh, uh, closing plenary keynote, which is scheduled for 4:05. Although we'll probably run a little late today. And just uh, for uh, uh, just for timing purposes, uh, Rami mentioned uh, that that he's doing a breakout on uh, on uh, uh, Intel Data Center Manager. That's at two ten. We're gonna move on to the most. And Eugene, you get to keep the microphone. Um, we we'll move on to the third question, always the best question of the, of the day, which is um, to give our panel a magic wand. So we asked this last year. We said, if I gave you a magic wand and you could just remove any constraint or create any capability uh, that, you, that you can imagine, what would it be? And last year's re responses ranged all the way up to and including, um, thank you, Kirby, remove the speed of light as a constraint on my ability to network. Um, I've done prep calls. I don't think we're going to get speed of light again, but I would like each of you to just tell me um, uh, briefly what, you know, if you had the ability to change anything to either create a new capability or remove a constraint, what would it be? Eugene, go ahead. I would uh, go to ICD, you know, the corporate director program, and, and strongly urge them to train directors to understand this space. Uh, it's a big problem. It's a private company or a public company. And those that uh, yeah, yeah. those okay. that um, understand that, right, will do it better. And and you know, pass me a note and it's the right cheat note. Replicate <laughs> AWS. So all, all boards, executives hear about AWS. So they don't understand the implications of how to use it properly. And could you clone that very? They spend billions. That type of capability inside your company. And uh, we actually did a clean tire. Drive by a clean tire store. Every store is a mini cloud computing center. And that includes Marks, and that includes Portchat. And that design was the original design that we came up with, because guess what? You lose your network, I don't care who your carrier is, you're off the air, that store can't run. So we designed it as a hybrid cloud center, ultra high performance. You wouldn't believe what's in the back room of these stores today. Very cheap. And those cloud centers replicated AWS. AWS never goes off the earth. And today, if you look at Canadian Tire and all its assets, they never go off the earth. That was quite different seven years ago. And that allows the company to, to, to grow and develop and just every time you drive by one of the stores, not a commercial, I would ask you to shop to it, that's good. But that's not the point, is it's how we design the, the ultra high performance net computing for the store. Now, if we had fiber and other things to the stores, that would help. But you get my point. That design, by the way, is being replicated by retailers the world over, and especially in Europe, where, where time is money. So I think, I think to replicate AWS's thinking uh, I was the resident expert for AWS at Canadian Tire. I made it my job. And I, I not only studied them, I, anytime somebody from Amazon Web Services spoke, I, I listened in. And, and I would spend time in Europe, mostly in Europe, listening to what they had to say. Because in America, in the US, it's all about go to California and have a nice, nice, nice life. Uh, and it's in Europe is where the action is. So that's, that would be the, the way. Thanks very much. I, had, I saw Remy kind of waving his hand down there. So Remy, if you had the magic wand, what would you do? Yeah, uh, this might be a little bit more uh, early to my direct job, but it would be the, the true use of industry standards and, and protocols, right? Uh, we hear about all these uh, protocols, especially for data center management, and they're, they're supposed to be standard, but they're really not. <laughs> so there's a lot that, goes, that has to be done behind the scenes in a solution like data center manager to be able to communicate with all different types of vendors. And uh, you know things like Redfish is supposed to you know fix that, but we're we're seeing actually trends that it might not. So that's what scares me. I'd love to illuminate that and you know so because it, it it impacts the our capabilities and abilities to actually you know help in terms of data center management and things like uh, doing monitoring of liquid cooling systems, where this is a capability that we're working on right now. Every single liquid cooling manufacturer has a different way of monitoring and managing, even though they're using SNMP, it's completely different. 
from one to the, to the other. So that gives us a big thing uh, to deal with. Standardization is a great one. Andrew, if, it, if we gave you the magic wand, what would you say? Well, I, I said before, I think there's a gap between customer and, uh, and data center, so I agree with what Eugene was saying about educate, so I think everybody needs to do a better job of educating their customers, but there's some big players out there that are kind of stealing stealing the world in this space, and so I think there's more co-opetition needs to happen. I think that the organizations here, smaller organizations, need to band together, quite frankly. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, what, I haven't heard anything about quantum. Uh, what does, is, that, is that reality? Is that change in the game at some point? I don't know. The doctor can quite speak to that. <laughs> We're getting there, although she had something else. Francois, um, you, when we spoke uh, about this, you mentioned kind of physical form factor as something you'd like to address a magic wand on. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, actually, uh, I changed my mind since we talked. <laughs> We can give you two magic wands if yeah. you'd like one for each hand. Yeah, Actually, the speed of fly, I like it, like us to, to, uh, to your point, is uh, the network thing is definitely a key bottleneck in all the projects, actually. You could have a great data center, but no, that's a network. What you just said at the beginning, eh? like data center and network always kind of look at each other. But we did a big migration of uh, the V Clouder uh, environment to our environment uh, with uh, the VMware HEX product. The product kind of wasn't working at the beginning, but then it worked after. It's just to make consistent, the workload consistent between data centers. Where we got the most trouble is network actually. So okay, if I can improve the speed of life, I have infinite capacity. I, th I thought about using, changing the, the physics of water so it can propagate light very quickly and with infinite capacity, but that's for another era. But more, um, but definitely, and we move all those network uh, protocol issues and have a super, like a, you know, uh, a super hacking network uh, orchestrator and, and a protocol that deals with all the old network issues, that'd be great. So that's my, that was my first one. My second one is, the tough thing, we talked about super software-defined power. Um, this is something we actually are looking into in how we optimize our use of, of the power. I was actually in, a, in an enterprise data center last week in, in Asia, and um, they have seven megawatts of critical IT. They have 16 two megawatt generators deployed in the facility. Something is wrong there. Uh, where there is a ratio between what they deploy in raw capacity and what they're actually using at the server level, that could be four or five. They, we need to do much better than this as an industry, uh, to, especially for collocation providers, without, you know, uh, arming the, the reliability of the, of the thing. We have the chance to have an integrated model, to your point as well, so customer doesn't have to care which equipment. Uh, and we could actually also put some sensor in the rack, so what uh, we discussed here, and that's what we, we're doing, like smart fuse, smart PDU, smart breakers. So we could actually run like a, a microgrid in the data centers, and depending on, on the load, we could actually affect the, the right amount of power to the right, uh, to the right racks, actually. That's like the project we're working on, and I'd like it to go faster. <laughs> That's what magic wands are for. Got it. When, when we spoke, you had all kinds of magic wands you wanted as well. <laughs> so mine would be uh, to remove the uh, people, human resistance to change. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> <laughs> working in research, I think that's sometimes one of our biggest obstacles. When you go to people with a new idea, they're like, ah, we've been doing things this way that have been working. We're not really sure why we needed to change that. And you're like, oh, because in the future, it's not going to keep working this way. I'm like, ah, we'll wait for the future to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a researcher, I see a lot of that. Uh, we've had, the, like, we have designed virtual managers to take CPU utilization into consideration <coughs> and energy efficiency and things like that. And people would, like, would go to a data center and say, hey, can I test that? They said, yeah, sure, but you cannot touch the servers. Like, I'm not touching the server. I'm just collecting information even from outside, not really in the server. Like, no, don't touch my server. Right? <laughs> so uh, it would be great if people are a little bit more flexible and open to new ideas. Uh, so that when research or when universities come with new ideas, we're able to test them, able to make sure that they're deployable and people can use them. Thanks, Stefan. That's that's your cue to bring us the other point of view altogether. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm completely aligned. There's a couple of things I wanted to bring up before I bring the magic wand. One is small. I'll just 
quickly touch on the risk component. He said, you know, bank talking about taking risk. First and foremost, you know what a bank's business is? Risk. Exactly. It's all measured risk, and they make money off of risk. And yet, then we, we tell them about data centers, oh, we want to take no risk. Exactly your point. You want to know why? Because data centers, the mindsets, the executives, the older ones that have retired, you're an exception to the rule, good sir. They were, uh, they, they grind their teeth in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which is all single points of failure. And since then, we've built resiliency, redundancy, and fault tolerance, and we don't take advantage of that. Oh, we're not allowed to do any maintenance in the middle of our business day, you know, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Really? And you're saying 3 o'clock in the morning in Hong Kong isn't any more important to you anymore in this global environment? So all this old mindset is what the problem is. All I'm doing is trying to introduce exactly the fact that we can take advantage of the investments we made in order to save money. And that's how I'm trying to find money in order to buy more things. Now, that, here's the great thing. So we get more money, we buy new things, we make it fantastic, we go into some of our partners at CoLogix and so on and so forth, and it's like, oh, it's, it's much cheaper, it's much more effective, it's software defined, this, that, and the other thing. You only, you only pay for what you use, you can ramp up, you can ramp down. I'm in. Can I have some of that? Absolutely. And then you take in where I want the magic wand. Help me migrate loads for free without risk. <laughs> <laughs> My business case is really sad. I, I think everybody's everybody's on board with that. <laughs> Peter, what word? Yeah, if we gave you the magic wand, you're just going to help uh, help Stefan with that, or do you have a? <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask you what uh, my friend uh, said here. Uh, I said I've been in this business for a while, and um, I always uh, struggle with you know this is the most uh, risk-averse conservative industry, but it's interesting that in this industry, in this business, everybody wants to embrace innovation on the product, on the solution, as long as that product or solution has been around for 20 years. <laughs> now that's, that's some innovation. Uh, um, so uh, just uh, uh, 30 seconds about the next big thing coming in this, uh, this business, which is uh, edge data centers. Uh, we talked a little bit about 5G, we talked about uh, what it means in terms of uh, Internet of Things, and uh, the, next, the next logical component here is going to be is going to be uh, uh, the edge data center. Every not everybody, but a lot of uh, the big players and uh, and startups are gearing up for uh, for this explosion. If you look at uh, difference between 4G and 5G, uh, uh, 5G is uh, millimeter uh, wave, uh, wave uh, for uh, wavelength, a uh, uh, very short uh, um, propagation, uh, uh, not very good penetration through. Also, um, in uh, five years or so. Uh, right now, uh, if you look at 4G, we have about four million towers around the country, around the world. Uh, when uh, uh, 5G is going to become uh, ubiquitous, are we going to have between 70 and 100 million towers? Uh, in in a place like Toronto, probably going to have um, a density of about 150 cells uh, uh, square kilometers. Strange to use uh, kilometers uh, for me coming from Nigeria. Uh, uh, so um, you have like on, on average of seven towers in uh, for uh, you know the 4G environment, and uh, and then you're going to have these data centers that uh, and data uh, micro data centers in your manufacturing, the hospital. You're going to have edge data centers. Uh, some of them will be located at the the base of the uh, of the tower. Some of them are going to be located in the middle of the uh, of the city or uh, power and security is going to be important. Um, Open 19 is essentially geared for that. Uh, uh, as you probably know, uh, what's unique about Open 19 it has this, uh, this uh, plane on the back of the, the rack. I mean, that's a big, biggest innovation. It's, uh, it has uh, a, a plane on the back of the rack, and uh, um, the server is called Brick. And uh, the idea is this will be unmanned facilities, obviously. Uh, so uh, the FedEx driver will be the person that will replace the server in the in the uh, in the rack. It's just a, it's just a, a, a plug and play. It's going to take the one brick and uh, replace it. So that will require indeed a sea of uh, sensors. It's going to require the most the most accurate uh, uh, ability to monitor these uh, these facilities. Uh, you're going to have a um, uh, you're going to have a power supply for the whole rack. It's not that uh, now you have uh, power supplies in each in each server. It's going to be, and uh, the density uh, it's going to be um, approaching 400 400 watts per uh, per uh, uh, processor, uh, as opposed to 150 when we have right now. It's going to have 
CPU and GPUs there, and uh, um, uh, liquid cooling is going to be the next uh, the, the next uh, uh, thing. Uh, Novak 7000 is probably some of the, uh, uh, but there are other solutions. But uh, essentially, uh, and this is going to be this is going to be the the, the next thing. Uh, micro micro clouds and uh, uh, micro data centers will be will be uh, become the, the next big big thing in this industry. Thanks. I don't actually get to answer this question, but I've decided to give myself a magic wand too because. I hear about 70 to 100 million uh, towers with uh, edge data centers, billions of edge points, and contrast that with one very stressed environment. I'm really hoping for a whole massive influx, influx of uh, clean power as a part of this equation here. <laughs> Sean, you get the last word here. We gave you a magic wand. What would you pick? Yeah, I think, um, look, we've talked about a tremendous amount of challenges that we see coming forward in the data center. Um, we're looking for solutions towards those, AI, IoT, et cetera. I think all great initiatives, but without the actual backbone across, you know, particularly in this country, and that's how we move the data in and out of these facilities, I think we're in for a big challenge. I think we're stressed on capacity today, and the demand for more data roads in and out of these facilities is huge. Um, without the network, these are just islands with no boat, no plane coming to that resort. So nobody's coming in or out. So we need to increase that capacity. I mean, the next generation of folks coming on, like the story about the Instagram, um, you know, my youngest son's 11. I don't think he's ever turned on cable TV. Everything is watched over the computer. Um, you know, I, I saw him the other day, he called me over at the computer, and I'm always nervous when an 11-year-old calls me over and says, hey, you gotta look at this, because I'm not sure what I'm gonna find, but I got there, and uh, he's got a Mac, so it's got that cute little rainbow spinning wheel that just goes around and around, and he says, what's happening? And I was like, well, I think it's, it's loading. He's like, what's it loading? I'm like, it's loading your video. He's like, how long do you think it's gonna be? I said, I don't know. When it's ready, it'll just start playing. He's like, oh. He sat there literally for 15 seconds, he got bored, he went off and did something else. And that's, they have to have that immediate gratification. It needs to be quick, it needs to be instantaneous. And that comes down into the corporate world where we're hooking people in on products they need to buy and how they're getting it. It needs to be there, it needs to be accessible quick. So if I could change anything, definitely look at capacity. Those roads in the ground need to increase. They need to increase quickly because our assumption is outpacing the infrastructure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and skip right, because we're already over time, but uh, this is just, I'm not going to let you guys go without getting one more set of words of wisdom from you, um, because this is such a great panel. So Sean, you get the mic, you get to start. What, you know, thinking about this whole discussion, which has ranged pretty widely, um, and uh, of the notion of aligning data center capacity with uh, growing IT service delivery demand, what words of wisdom would you have for the folks in the room today? Yeah, I think as you as you look to plan where your business, where your where your infrastructure is heading, try to think as far out as possible. And I know that's tough, especially in today's economy, in today's world. It's hard to think three years out, but try to make those decisions as future proof as you can versus just day one deployments. Don't look at what your need is today, but look at where that's going to be in 36 months from now. I don't think you can go much further out than that, Michael, just because I mean things are changing so fast, but at least try to try to look out a minimum of 24 or 36 months for your business and ensure the flexibility is going to be built into that solution. So longish long term vision, is that, that's, that's that's good advice. Rami, what would you, what would you add to that or, or yeah, echo that? Answer, uh, what you just said very much. And to add to that, I, I think uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I wanted to say. So first of all, uh, in addition to planning ahead, uh, use tools and, and uh, whatever, whether it's ours or from anyone else, uh, to be able to manage your, your data center growth, growth more uh, in a more meaningful way. Don't, for example, uh, just buy and because you need it now, uh, think of the future and use things like your actual power and CPU utilization to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. Lots of people don't do that. There's, uh, you, you can do things like uh, use the historical data of how your systems are being utilized to plan ahead. That's very easy and, and common, but still lots of people don't do that. Uh, so you can do also power capping so that you prevent, you know, uh, 
unexpected situations from occurring. So that's one thing. And the second thing is to also, uh, you know, stay on top of the technologies. Uh, you know, companies like Intel have grown in the in the past based on increasing frequency, increasing cores, etc. It's not going to be that anymore, right? Like we we said, we're approaching the, the limits of Moore's law, so we're looking into things like software-defined silicon and investing a lot into protocols and standards. This is going to be the future. Uh, you know all the telemetries that, 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 that are exposed and embedded in those servers, that's just going to continue to grow. So um, I guess as part of that, uh, you know, staying on top of the technologies and what the Intel is doing, we're not just the you know, number of cores anymore, but also, um, you know, limit, reducing the gap between the hardware people and the software people. Usually the people who are actually doing the racking and stacking and planning, they have no clue of the applications that are running in their data centers and how how they're being utilized. That has to, that gap has to uh, get reduced over time. And same with the application uh, and software guys. They just want to run their software on something. They don't care how it's being utilized. Uh, give me more, give me more. So uh, I'm fortunate to be one of those few who's actually in the middle always between hardware and software. And I know lots of people don't think of Intel as a software company, but believe it or not, there's a huge group uh, working on software within Intel. Thanks. Thanks. I think the notion of, of reducing that hardware software gap and using tools, not just to manage data center growth, but to manage data centers is a really good one. During the break, a bunch of our exhibitors, uh, Intel itself, of course, but ABSS, Cohesity, Belden, um, and others offer software uh, tools. So please do stroll around uh, and, and get some more insight into that. Um, Andrew, what, what words of wisdom would you have for the folks here on, on what to do moving forward? I mean, you haven't heard already, I think I'll stick to the same theme as understand the customer. I mean, if you used to take orders from your customer, stop taking orders, start understanding what they're doing with your engine, as, uh, as Eugene put it, so you can understand what you then need to deliver rather than building stuff in the back room and not really knowing what's, uh, what's going on uh, at, the, uh, at the application level or even what they're doing with their customers. I think, you know, I think that's really important, like, you know, understand your customer is one, is, is certainly easy, an easy way to encapsulate that, but just bringing a business perspective to the business of operating uh, data centers, which is in, uh, inherently a technical challenge, uh, I think is really, really good guidance. And, and you know, uh, Rami talked about the gap between hardware and software, the gap between business execs, as Eugene was mentioning earlier, and the technical execs who whose services are essential to the operation of the business is, is absolutely worth focusing on. So thank you. Um, Francois? Yeah, so I'd like to come back on what you said. Uh, it's not about data center, it's about engine movement. It's about uh, something a bit more than data center, actually. It's about also about your data. Uh, and so if I, if I take a little bit of focus on the data, when you choose to go to a third party or to a cloud provider, you're handing a bit the key to some of your data and it's a question of trust. Uh, and you have to establish that trust with, uh, with uh, the partner. Uh, and it's very important and, um, and it's for the long term as well. It's not just for a, you know, a couple of, uh, actually, let me take that back. It could be for a very small amount of time if you were able to tier your data in different level of sensitivity. You probably have a lot of data that is not that sensitive. And even banks can take risks with data that is, I'm sure a lot of your compute is not that sensitive and you could outsource it to the, to the cloud fairly easily. But there's part of it where you have compliance and you have very strict regulation where you need to have a very strict um, control of that data and then you behave differently. There is no one size fits all when you, you uh, mm -hmm. own data. You have different level of data. And when you, uh, when you go for a partner, yeah, there's the question of trust. And the reason I, I'm saying that is um, at OVH, we've made a definite decision to stay in the infrastructure as a service or a bit of platform as a service uh, business. We, we're never going to compete with uh, our customers. Uh, that, that's important uh, to establish that trust. Uh, and I think that's uh, that the word of wisdom I'd like to, to say. But yeah, we, we are definitely uh, very aware of that. And customer giving, you know, Data, it's a huge responsibility, huge responsibility. And I think uh, as a cloud provider, we, we really kind of uh, put that on the, you know, the first, you know, on, in terms of values, this is our first value here. 
working together with the customers and trust in, 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 in ending your data. Thanks very much. Uh, um, trust in your data management suppliers, trust in your data management, trust in your data is something Mary and I talk about really for an uncomfortably long period of time. And <laughs> it's just, but it's a complicated and fascinating topic. Thank you. Um, Gada, what would your words of wisdom be here? Okay, so mine are going to be a little bit different because I am from academia and what else you have in industry. So I would say uh, be more open to relationships between industry and academia. I think a lot of people think to be able to collaborate with universities, you have to have millions and millions of dollars to spare. Uh, I would like to say this is not the actual truth. Our founding partner was actually a startup company. So SMEs can definitely coll collaborate with universities. Universities can get work done, uh, unlike what a lot of people say. We have people that come, up, come, with, come for us, like, ah, oh, take something small, and then we'll, after we build this trust, they come back. Uh, so we have reached to amazing talent, which is uh, students and millennials who are working on the new apps and thinking outside of the box. So we have amazing reach to those people who can come and work on the problems that you have. I encourage you to look at the posters, see what the, some of the problems that we're talking, uh, that we're dealing, like we're uh, researching. Talk with me or any of the students. They're much more. We just have space for 10. Um, and again, I would like to say, be more open to new ideas and innovation. When we want to test um, DCIM in your facility, don't tell me, oh, IT and operation, don't talk, uh, IT and facility don't talk to each other. I need them to talk to each other. I need to be able to monitor IT and uh, infrastructure to be able to do uh, collect analytics and do prediction and improve on the efficiency of the data centers. So that would be it. Thank you. Stefan? You know, yeah, on that front, a couple of things. First of all, RBC does partner with universities. We do what's called packathons so that we can meet and greet all the new talent coming through and then we try to get them to come on board. Um, part of what you said I absolutely believe in because my mandate about a year and a half ago was exactly that, was to bridge IT and engineering together. Now we're in one group under my leadership, so exactly for all the reasons you just mentioned. Um, my, my advice or my suggestion is we did talk about 24 to 36 months from an IT perspective. Quite frankly, if I knew more than six months down the pipeline, I'd be pretty impressed, so we struggle with that. <laughs> but from an infrastructure, from a portfolio perspective across the entire globe, um, I'm actually working with the gentleman right up front here in Love Enterprises to come up with a, with a tool set that gives us insights to not only lease and property ownership and so on, back a house, end of life, tech refreshes and so on and so forth, you should be looking 5, 10, even 20 years down the road. And why do I say that? There's technology refreshes, especially the back house stuff. That's a long term affair and so on. I get that technologies from an IT perspective changes. However, if you know ahead of time, you can start making good decisions. For example, it might be economical for you to go to the cloud rather than the technically refresher facility app. Maybe change the way you do that, but that might take five years. So if you're short, you're short setting yourself on three years, I would suggest taking a further look. Now, on all that front, it's worth a lot of money. I've already proven that out. It's going to be substantial. It's actually worth having a group of people. So in part of my organization, I have a small think tank of five individuals, uh, all of higher caliber, director or higher, that are looking at strategic initiative and keeping track of industry and seeing what new technologies are in so that you never know what problem you need to solve, but you want to make sure that they're current at all times. I would suggest to you as the advice, just ensure you have a core group of people that isn't doing this on the side of the table, but do it full time in order to to help your industry or your, your enterprise. Thank you. Peter? Um, I'm going to go into a totally different direction. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think that it's one of the most important things we're facing today is, is power. If you look at the data center population around the world, <coughs> about 1,800 major data centers. They, they use approximately 420 terawatt hour of uh, energy. Uh, if you add another 220 to 250 used by network, uh, that represents more than 3% of the total consumption. Uh, and even more important, it represents more than 4.5% of all the uh, carbon generated in the world. Uh, it's, it's a problem that will continue. Uh, the projection is that uh, uh, by 2030, it's going to generate 14.5% of the total carbon. Uh, and if you look around what, uh, what uh, you know, the, the positive feedback coming from here, look at what happened in South America the other day, uh, on half of the continent without power, you look at the events in, uh, um, in the States with uh, 
the fires in California and Katrina and see in the uh, Fukushima and San Onofre, if you can look at the, all the concerns about cybersecurity, uh, um, we all, all part of this industry need to recognize the fact that, uh, that uh, um, power is becoming the, the key, the key to the survival, not only of the pen, but also of, the, of, the, of our industry. Uh, Microgrid's ability to, to safely generate power and uh, uh, for companies to have the ability to have um, some control of their own uh, power destiny, I think, is becoming very, very important. Thank you, and, and not just our industry, but our, our entire world, right? We had Dr. Garton kicked us off yesterday with a discussion of, um, of sustainability, and thank you for flagging that. That is truly um, words of wisdom worth, worth hearing. Eugene, you get the last word here. Well, I think it's, um, it's a finance problem at the end of the day. Uh, all cost optimization is important, power, all these things are very important, networking. But the finance people, I have a CPA, 352724, so I'm licensed to speak. <laughs> I've spoken to three conferences, finance folks, about the digital world, and I call it Digital World 2.0. And, you know, you're living in it. Uh, RBC is a good prime example. Um, there's a struggle, but they have to live in it. And, and companies that know how to live in that world will, will survive and prosper, others will not. I grew up in North Hill. I know what it takes and what it didn't. Um, and we can see the end of that company. Because when faced with choices, um, too many bean counters cause problems. So I've spoken to the FBI a few times, and I, most recently I talked about the AI world needing 100,000 million times more, pick a number. It's a big number, more, more computing than we ever thought possible. That's what an AI world does. You look at what Canadian Tire's Team X is doing. Whatever estimate on computing, I just add one times 100,000. And I'm not talking GPU here. And, and you should have seen the finance video. Are you crazy? Then it happens. You build a bot and it changes your company. And, and Team X at Canadian Tire is building bots. $15,000 bot with a 2,000% return equals $35 million revenue. But it takes computing power like you've never seen before to do that. It does in 15 seconds what normally would take months to do through all other means. And that autastic world is here. And companies are starting to take advantage of it. I came back to New York. I was spending all of my time on Wall Street talking to money ballers. People who are trying to figure out where the money is. You know, I, 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 when I retired, I thought, okay, I have a nice retirement vineyard farm in Niagara. Yeah? Um, I know the roots of New York better than, than the root here. I, so the Wall, Wall Street guys are hunting on this thing, because, and it's all based on this. You have to be able to do that well. You have to be able to compute, you have to be able to calculate, and to do it in real time. You know, there's a logistics company that I, I've started doing some, some, I'll call it light work with. Each event takes eight hours to clear a load across that border. They can do it now in 10 minutes. And the question for me is, could you figure out how to do it in a minute? Okay? And think of the computing required to do that. So our, all numbers are, are suspect at this point. And, you know, if you're right, if I was running a financial institution, I talked to one um, uh, in New York. New York is interesting because they have a particularly biased perspective. Some good, some bad. The CIO of a, a large insurance company, he was shocked on, um, on Tuesday when we talked. He's like, you really think that's going to happen? Yeah. And so, so, and yeah, it'll take power. There's going to be carbon footprint. There's going to be network required. But our kids aren't going to settle for non-real-time mode. Forget it, right? It's, and, and, and what was that thing, the, the thing that your son saw? It's just not there, right? And so that world is here, digital 2.0. If you haven't put a lot of thought on digital, you are the, the pioneers of digital 2.0. Uh, and then I'll, I'll give you some language around that about the ice age, coming ice age, because if we don't do this right, uh, there will be all sorts of massive problems. And you know, so I think that would be the thing. So finance needs reform. Uh, financial uh, officers, executives, and leaders need to, to give their head a shake. And 
you look at the curriculum of the CP, you get one course in MIS, I know I had to take the course. Uh, it doesn't do it. You have to understand the essence at this point, because the finance people in the world, that we are with the university, yeah, I'm on the board of university of finance, it's all numbers, it's all dollars and cents. And you know how I spell cents, dollars and cents? S-E-N-S-E, -E. and they go, oh, hell. You know, when faced with superior thinking, and that's what superior thinking does, you need to think in a superior way. Not that you're superior, but your thought processes are superior. Because we're counting the cents, and it makes no sense the way we're doing it today. And the whole industry, and there are some very fine finance people I've worked with, they are rare. Because the guys would say, well, you know, could you not shave 2% off that? When, when, well, hold on, you're running your company on this stuff. So that's the theme for me. It's, it's everywhere I go, yet I do see companies, and they're mid-stage companies that know how to drive a money ball. If you haven't thought about money balling, and I'm hopefully going to write a book on it someday, it's triggers, traps, and tricks. You know, what are the what are the triggers to unlock a money ball? What traps do you face and then the trick? The the work that you're asked to do is unnatural. Okay, if you're working in what would be called a data center, it is unnatural. You are you are not respected for the work that you do. You only get stuff thrown at you when there's a problem. Thank yous are few and far between. It is a terrible business. And if you talk to my data, data groups in the various companies, especially my most recent one, we made them champions. They were the, the raptors for Canadian Tire. Right? Let's hear it for champions. <laughs> and it's unfortunate because I actually, uh, one of my open texters came to visit me and he said, We miss you. Because guess what? He's now back in the back, way in the battles now. But if you understand the fundamentals of how your company needs to run, you know, that's what we're talking about. And those fundamentals we need to re-educate. And that's what the universities, that's why I'm involved with some universities, the universities need to start re-educating. I like to see a course for finance executives on how Digital 2.0 works, and there, it doesn't exist. And that's what's going to change. If, when that changes, you'll see board level changes, you'll see executive changes, and, and all this more. Thank you. Thank you. That's terrific. Um, listen, I, I, I have dented my own, my own agenda pretty badly here, but I'm so happy that we made time for this final question. We, you know, we looked at innovation and collaboration and trust and you know, a shared vision for the future and the capabilities that it demands.